anticipation. Amen. 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 Good evening, St. Peter. Uh -oh. Good evening, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church and Zoom line and phone line. Let's get a let's get a mute going over there. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it is good to see y'all tonight um, on the Zoom line and good to hear your voices on the phone line. I want to take a moment to thank Reverend Edwards for her work on the last three nights as she continued to break the bread of life to all of those of us who gathered together. Uh, it's good to be here at the end of this week. Uh, I know they're saying there's going to be bad weather, but guess what? We're going to have church Sunday because it's virtual anyway. So if you, if you can come, come. If you can't come, we're going to be having church uh, because we know that the Lord has made a way for us to do so in this season. Um, I'm glad tonight to be able to continue to walk in this expectation moment. We're right at 670 days now of straight Bible study. How about that? 600 days, okay. 70 days of Bible study. Let's give God some praise uh, for allowing us to have been in this word for so long. Um, I'm grateful for all of the lessons that have been taught. I'm grateful for the life change. I'm grateful for the peace that have been given. I'm grateful for the joy that has been received, for the clarity that has been gained, um, for as we have stayed in and studied continuously this word of God, this living, eternal, transformative word of God. Tonight, we're going to continue in the book of First Timothy. First Timothy, we're going to be here tonight uh, studying continuously in this book of Timothy. Remember the Timothy. Um, Paul rather wrote this letter uh, to Timothy in light of things that he recognized that Timothy was facing, uh, what we are aware of um, historically and even through some of the commentary or comments that uh, P that, Timothy, that Paul made to Timothy, that Timothy was wrestling with this situation. I want to hear this. Timothy was wrestling with his, his responsibilities. He was wrestling with the duties. He was wrestling with the conflict. He was wrestling with false teachers. He was wrestling with personalities and people. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the challenge that the body of Christ faced then and even now. And so uh, while we may not be the pastor like Timothy, mm -hmm. uh, let's also understand that we're doing the work of the Lord like Timothy. And there's also always going to be conflict uh, that we must deal with. Um, but P Peter, Paul was very clear to Timothy and very clear to us uh, how we should stand, how we should posture ourselves in light of those challenges we face. And again, I don't know. I was thinking about this a few minutes ago. <clears throat> Serving the Lord is not should never be a, a, a work. It should be something we are joyful about. And even facing the challenges we face shouldn't be something that saddens us. It should inspire us to know that we're doing that which God has called us to do. That's what the Lord shared me to share with you all. So don't ever think because you got a challenge to mean God punish you. It means that you're where God wants you to be and he will strengthen you even in the challenge. How many know that God will strengthen you when you go through something? He will strengthen us yeah. based on challenges and trials and tribulations, especially as we yes. are doing well. Uh, in this chapter tonight, chapter one, uh, we're going to probably wrap it up tonight. Uh, we, I'll just give you just a little re re refresher course on what we learned the last few nights. Uh, Paul came out uh, preaching, uh, telling Timothy that he needed to stay uh, in Ephesus because sound teaching was needed. Paul, why was sound teaching needed? Paul said because there were false teachers there. Uh, he continued to talk about the reality that the word itself or the law itself was not bad, but it's when people took advantage of it or utilized it for bad purposes, which was bad. Uh, he moved on and then did a kind of a, uh, a reflection on his gratefulness for what God had done. And I, I got to read verse 12, if you don't mind about three verses together, 12, 13, and 14. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for he has counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injure, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul, I, I, in, in some ways, I think he was celebrating and reflecting on what God had done for him. In some ways, I think as well, he was encouraging um, Timothy for because um, Timothy may have felt that he wasn't qualified. Let me get some reverb here. And uh, so he may have been doing it for two reasons. And I think as well, for those of us today, he is he is letting us know that no matter what we did, but be because of where we are, and then he reminds us of where we are is because of the mercy of God through Christ Jesus. He lets us know that God can use us. And so let me stop here in, in January of 2022. Somebody who may think that what you've done, what you did, what you've been through, maybe even what you're wrestling with now, it, it disqualifies you for serving the Lord. I stand to say no, because we all who are saved have obtained mercy. Let me take my hand and point myself. I have obtained mercy. You have obtained mercy. And as a result, we're qualified uh, and because God has enabled us, counted us faithful, and put us into the ministry to do his work and his will. 
um, that's what that's what um, uh, Paul says in verses 12 through 12 through 14 in verse 15. I promise I'll move on after this. Paul reminds us of, again, the great work of God. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Therein lies the celebration for the saved and therein lies the opportunity for the unsaved. Can I say that one more time? Verse 15 says the, op the, the, the reason for praise is in verse 15 is that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Hallelujah. Because that was, that was us. And the, and the reason for hope for the unsaved is that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. So the saved celebrate the work of Christ because we are saved and the sinner can celebrate um, after, and they can, can be excited, I should say, or, and, uh, excited about life because Jesus came into the world to save them. What a, what a powerful comment. Paul says it's worthy to be accepted, uh, but it is faithful. It is true. That is the reality of the work of Jesus Christ in this world. Paul reminds us again in verse 16, he said, obtain mercy. Um, and that in, the, that in me, Christ Jesus, first Christ, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Paul says, I'm just an example of what Jesus can do. And I said this other night, and I said again, all of us who are saved, we're just examples of what Christ could do. If somebody says, well, um, I, I, I don't know, I'm from Atlanta, and I went to private school. God can't save me. Jesus can't save me. I was like, yeah, no, he can. Somebody else might have another testimony. I used to do this, and I used to do that, but Christ saved me. And somebody who's been that same situation, but I said, wow, really? Somebody might say, well, you know, I, I lost everything and, and, I, and I did everything to get it back, but I couldn't get it back. But Jesus brought me out. He saved my soul. All of the testimonies that each of us have individually are a sum total, a beautiful book of the reality of what Jesus Christ can do. He can save. He can save. He can save. No matter where we are, no matter where we were, no matter where we've been, no matter what we did, Jesus Christ saves us and then gives us mercy. So we're all saved folk are examples of what Jesus is able to do. Uh, I remember the other night we talked about this in verse 17. Paul got happy. He closed. He said, now to the king, eternal, that's that's God, immortal, that's God, invisible, that's God, the only wise God, God. He says to him, be honor and glory forever and ever. To Paul, you got to tell us why. He says, God is, is deserves honor and glory forever because of his work of salvation in the world. God deserves honor and glory forever because he is eternal God. He's an immortal God. He's an invisible God. He's the only wise God. And what else can you do when you've got an eternal God, immortal God, invisible God, and the only wise God except for what? Give him honor and glory forever. And that, my brother, sister, should be the posture that each of us should have that is in Jesus Christ. That there's never a day goes by when we don't take a moment to say, hallelujah, thank you, God, praise your name. Why? Because he is eternal, he's a king, he's immortal, he's invisible, he's the only wise God. That should always be our position. Now, let's get to the text for tonight. In verse 18, um, Paul then shifts gears. He uses the word he uses, I think, in verse 3. Um, yeah, he does use the verse three. He used the word charge. Now, Timothy, again, was Paul's son in ministry, son in, in, even in his walk with the Lord, because he had come to Christ as a result of the preaching of Paul, that God used Paul to preach. But he also, Paul had been ministering to him and encouraging him and, 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 and directing him toward Christ. Yet in this verse, in verse 18, and he used the word charge again. That is a command. In verse three, he says like this, Paul, you know, I left you at Ephesus that you might charge, you might command some that teach no other doctrine other than the doctrine of Jesus Christ. In verse 18, he's talking to Timothy directly. Timothy, I command you and I commit unto thee, thou, that Timothy, he says, my son, he wanted to, he wanted to make sure that Timothy didn't feel, um, um, broken because he apparently Timothy was very sensitive. He said, I charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy. He said, I'm charging you and challenging you and commanding you according to the prophecies which went on before thee. Let me pause here and tell a little bit about this. Paul apparently, uh, Paul had, I should say, had, had, had shared many things with Timothy. Timothy probably was sending messages back to um to t Peter Paul rather wherever he was talking about how this was a hard work and this was a tough work and each time Timothy would um Paul would respond through a prophecy that God would give him to um Timothy and let Timothy know what God had in store for him 
It may have been that he just encouraged it. It may have just been he said, but whatever it was, it was a prophetic word from God through Paul to Timothy, uh, encouraging him to continue the work that God had called him to do. And what I want to be clear about is what Paul was saying here in verse 18 was, Timothy, I want you to think about some of the things that were said to you that encourage you that you might continue or might as war a good warfare. Let me pause here and say this word right here. What Paul was in, Paul was telling Timothy was the work you are doing is a warrior's work. It's a soldier's work. It's a serious work. And it's a battle going on. Let me, Pastor Thomas, in 2022, tell St. Peter Missionary about the church the same thing. The work we do for the Lord is not extra. It's not volunteer. If somebody says, well, I'm volunteering. No, if you're a child of God, you serve it. you working. I remember when the boys were little, I, 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 one day my friend called, and uh, he said, what you doing? I said, I'm over here with me and the kids watching the game. He said, oh, you babysitting. I paused. I was like, no, I'm not babysitting. These are my kids. <laughs> I said, I'm doing what, what dad has done since day one. The same thing is true about the church work of the Lord. It's not work we just saying, all right, Lord, I'll do it. I got some time. No, it's what we're called to do. Timothy was charged. We Christians are charged. And we must understand that it's a battle, it's a war. And, and I want to sometimes war makes us fearful and fight but what all Timothy, Paul is trying to tell Timothy, all Paul is trying to tell us is this he said listen you St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church family friends are doing the work of the Lord and that there's an enemy, Satan is the enemy and what he's trying to do is undermine the work of God, we're on the battlefield for who? the Lord and so that means that there's work for us to do for the Lord that if we don't do then, then it won't get done, A, and that won't do. Somebody might miss out on the opportunity to experience the fullness of, of salvation in Jesus Christ. And I want somebody to understand that you ain't got to be the preacher, the deacon, the mother, the deaconess to do this. If you are saved, you got work to do for the Lord, all right? If you saved. And so it's warfare. So that means I've never heard of a soldier taking time off during the battle. They might get a what they call a... Um, leave when they get to port or sometime but they don't just say you know what this battle going on. i'm calling time out i gotta i gotta get some some neat they continue to war that's what we gotta say we have to continue to be diligent doing the work that god has called us to do now verse 19 is even more important because he's telling us the instruments or the attributes or the posture or the the, the thought process we must have to fight this good warfare he says holding faith that means that first and foremost each of us that are in jesus christ must have faith have faith in what? Have faith in God. But more than that, have faith that God is capable of doing what God has promised, that we must trust God. We must believe God. We must believe in God and believe that God is going to do what he said and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's having faith, holding faith. See, it's easy to be distracted. It's easy to be disappointed. But as long as we hold on, somebody says, well, God can do it. There's a common time in your life when you got to say, you know what? I heard it, but I believe it now. Oh, I'm going to try him. I'm going to trust him that God will do it. That, And I think many of us in our Christian lives have seen it, but it, that doesn't mean it won't happen again, that you have to come to your prayer and say, God, I believe you can do it. I'm putting this in your hands and I'm trusting you. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. And that's what God is telling us through Paul, through this book of Timothy, that we must hold faithful, stay faithful, hold fast to our faith and trust in God. Every time we see this word, well, I shouldn't say every time, but a lot of times we see this word faith, it's about holding it. Why? Because we're easily distracted. We're easily disappointed. We easily walk away. Let me pause parenthetically and go back in time. The children of Israel, uh, in the book of Judges, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, they constantly were going through troubles because they lost their faith. They were like, oh, God, deliver us. As soon as they got out of trouble, they get in trouble again. Why? Because they weren't holding their faith. Holding your faith means you're taking God his word, but you're also keeping your eye on God. You can't say, I'm trusting God and not pray. You can't say I'm trusting God and not being his word. You can't say I'm trusting God and not and not and not pray uh, not praise and worship him. You can't say I'm trusting God and not serve him. All these things are attributes which strengthen our ability to hold fast in our faith in God through, through Jesus Christ. Then he says, look at verse 19, hold faith and have a good conscience. What is a good conscience? A good conscience is more than just feeling okay about what you're doing. It means that you have done what you were called to do. I remember years ago, and this has been a long time because the boys are grown now just about, but I remember years ago, uh, I told Isaiah, um, they were supposed to rotate days taking the garbage out. This is when they were little boys. 
they were just taught us to put a garbage can, but uh, I thought they should give it a shot. They couldn't get it up there to help them, but I said, give it a shot. So one day I remember coming, being at the church, coming back home and the garbage can was up in the driveway. And I said, okay. So I went in the house, Isaiah was in the kitchen. I said, did you put this up? And he looked kind of nervous. He's like, yeah. And I said, you put it right near the house. And I guess he thought maybe he took it the wrong place. He said, yeah. I said, well, good for you. He said, that was the right place. I said, yeah, you great job. The expression on his face told it all. He was happy to have done it, but he was happy to have done it right. And that's what, that's the, in his presentation showed it. He, he bounced up the stairs because he was excited because he had pleased daddy. Here's the truth. As we do the work of God and we do it right, as we live the will of God and live it right, as we obey God and follow God and we do it right, not only will we have done it, but we'll have a good conscience. We'll we'll have a bump, bump and hop in our step. We won't be easily put down by others. Sometimes when people think they got something on you, they'll try to put you down. But when you know you're doing the work God has called you to do, when you know you're obedient to God, guess what? You can stand in it, stand strong on it, have faith, trust God, praise God, no matter what's going on, because you have a good conscience and the enemy cannot condemn you. The enemy cannot um, say you're guilty. The enemy cannot put you down because you have a good conscience because you know you're doing right what the Lord wants you to do and you're right where God wants you to be. So that's a part of our fighting a good battle, having holding faith and having a good conscience. Paul says this, and, and good, remember that like good conscience is not by how you feel, it's also about what you do. Now, let's get a little deeper. Paul says, some folk, unfortunately, Timothy and St. Peter, have um, put away concern their faith. They lost faith, and as a result, they did what they wanted to do. And, 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 and here's what happens, and here's what happened in the, in, the, in the early church. Some folk would just be cruising on real good, but something would come up. Some situation would come up, some temptation would come in and it would trick them into saying, you know what, I, yeah, I did believe that, but you know, I'm going to modify my faith a little bit. I'm going to modify what I believe a little bit. Therein lies the problem. You can't modify what God said you to do, can you? You can't, you can't make it, a, make, can't make it comparable and comfortable. It has to be what God says or nothing. They put away their concern, their faith and have made a shipwreck. What does that mean? That they shipwreck their journey. A, a, a journey, a shipwreck journey, kind of like, think about a, a, a train. A train gets derailed. Uh, a car's wreck. The reality is that if we don't walk and trust God, and if we do say, well, I'm going to try it my way and do what I want to do, guess what? We'll find ourselves shipwrecked. Now, of course, the ship that's wrecked can get back on course, but it's wrecked. And so that has to be a course correction. What Paul is saying is as we hold faith and have a good conscience and do the work that God's called us to do, we won't be shipwrecked. I, I, we won't be derailed. We won't be wrecked. Instead, we'll be where God wants us to be, and there'll be no need to get re re, re, re back on back on track and that is the that is the challenge and let me say this pastorally over the last 18 years and um one week and three days um what i understand is is that there have been many there are many who are out in the streets today because they shipwrecked because they had faith and, and wavered they trusted god and then didn't they said i'm gonna try god but then they stopped and as a result they found themselves wrecked and there always is a a recovery period from wrecking and, and what I'm saying is, let us be aware. Let me pause and do a commercial. That's who God is about to send back to us. And let us under, let us be available and bold enough to say, hey, you know, you, you, you got off course, but God welcomes you back to course. But what you got to do this time is to have faith and a good conscience. Do trust God and stay where God wants you to do and do what God wants you to do. He said, in that way, there'll be no more shipwrecks. Paul says this in verse 20. Now watch this. There were two men, and we don't know much about these two men, but we do know that Paul called him out in A. And then B, we also know that Paul tells what happened to them. Hymenius and Alexander are two men that Paul says are example of people who didn't hold fast to their faith and didn't have a good conscience, and they made a wreck of things. But this is what Paul said happened. He said, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They began to talk against God. They began to question God and question God and have these conversations in public places. Let me pause right there and go back to verse four. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. These men began to drift off into other stuff. They began to no longer talk about the word of God and God's God's grace and mercy and began to challenge questions and ask questions and, 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 and become more uh, legalistic than, than spiritual. They became more about the law than about the spirit of God moving in them. And as a result, their faith in God faltered 
and their actions for God faltered. And as a result, Paul said, I delivered unto Satan. Now, let me tell you what Paul means. Paul simply says, as he didn't say God killed him, and he certainly didn't tell Satan to hurt him. What he did was, he said they were being a problem. Now, listen to this. They had become a problem in the fellowship. Their actions, their discussions, their proclamations began to be a problem in the body of Christ. And Paul says, y'all got to get out because y'all not going to break everybody else down because y'all confused. And as a result, they were left out into the world. Now, going back to what we just said a moment ago about the world, the world has a way of doing one of two things, driving you back to the Lord or driving you deep into the world. I've both been in the world and the world stuff was so awful. You said, I need to come back to the Lord. And that's what Paul was saying. One thing I said is, Pastor, and I, I mean, two or three, y'all heard me say this. Somebody said, what are we going to do with that? I said, God got to handle that. God gives us the ability to minister. But some situations, God has to take, has to deal with somebody. If somebody's so out there that they don't want to hear none of the Bible saying, none of the preachers saying, none of the deacons saying, none of the word saying, God got to get their attention in his own way. That's what Paul was saying about these two men. They had become so dysfunctional and though disengaged and so turned around about their faith in God in Christ. And they had become the talk through it, act on it, that Paul said, got to let them go and God will handle them and, 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 and turn them over to Satan. He, he said, I'm turning over to the world and that, that, that would give them another chance to see freshly and freely what God is capable of doing. That's what this verse was letting us know. And that's what this chapter is letting us know in regards to the life of Timothy and the life of Christians today. We have to stick, stay close to the word of God. We have to stay in it. All right. Then we got to understand that there's no reason for us to be fearful about who we are because we were all beneficiaries of the mercy of God. That's true. We should all rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ came to save, came to save sinners because if he came to save anybody else, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have qualified. We should be grateful and we should praise God daily as a result of who we are. We ought to know that we serve an eternal king an immortal king, an invisible God, the only wise God. And as a result, we should do what? Give him praise and glory and honor how long? Forever and ever. And finally, let us understand that part of our success in our work for the Lord is to have whole faith and have a good conscience. Do right so we can know right. I'm going to stop there tonight. And I, I meant to be short tonight. Well, I wasn't too long. But I thank God for this. And tomorrow night, we're going to pick up a chapter two. But I pray that these words that we have discussed today and studied today will strengthen us in our walk for the Lord. I do pray that these words that we discussed tonight will give us insight into how we are to live for the Lord and that we'll be stronger as a result of it. Let us pray together tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come this night to say thank you for the magnificent grace, the magnificent mercy, the deep joy, and the constant peace that you've given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, help us to know that we serve you, the immortal King, Eternal King, the only our wise God, invisible God. And right now, your people come to give you honor and glory and praise forever and ever. I pray, God, tonight that these words will get in our hearts, that we may strengthen our inner man. Let these words get in our hands and feet, that we can serve you better. Let your word get in our ears so that we can hear what you are saying, as opposed to the rumblings of this world. Let your word get in our minds and let it get on our minds, dear God, that we would have peace with the surpasses all understanding and that the fiery darts of Satan would be quenched. God, I do pray that you would let your word get on our lips, our tongues, our vocal, our lungs, and our throats, that we may declare this word to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, tonight I pray that you bless every household richly, that you bless every individual Christian that is on this Zoom line tonight, and that you bless every family that's represented tonight. We pray a special prayer tonight, Lord, for uh, Deaconess Spear. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that she is talking and, and we pray, God, for a recovery, full recovery in her situation. Pray for our family. And then, God, we pray for family to all those others who are on this phone line tonight who are in Zoom line tonight and have someone in need of prayer. Bless us, strengthen us, keep us by your love, oh God, and by your power. And it is now in, in every ears in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you tonight. Hold on, Zoomers. God bless you tonight, phone line.